Bride Ministries Church now has a brand new app. While you're waiting for our service to begin, take a moment to check out what it can do. If you missed a sermon, you can access the latest messages right from our homepage. If you scroll down, you can see the latest podcasts. It's simple to tithe. All you have to do is tap that heart button at the bottom of your screen. The menu button at the top of your device will let you see the latest announcements. And check this. You know, Father God, we thank you for worship. Father God, we thank you for praise. Father God, we thank you that you desire intimate communion and fellowship with each one of us individually. But you also desire intimate communion and fellowship with each of us as a corporate body. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship together across timelines, state lines, internationally, Lord God. We thank you for our community that you are building. Lord God, we thank you that you are opening up a new era in the earth in this hour and season, and that we get to be participants in it. Lord God, that we are going to see Things in your kingdom move to a level that has not before been witnessed. And it's going to be backed by prayer, worship, and fasting. Lord God, we just invite you to rest upon this room. We thank you that we have eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying and hearts to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I want to invite you to have your seats. You know, I, I, I really love the, the, the ability to engage God without, you know, distraction. Many of you, this is awesome watching you guys pick up the flags around the room and Zero in on Jesus like no one else is here. This is every week. This is where we're going. Even when we come back to the platform ministry of worship and the administration of that, the goal is that we as a body are pulling in the glory. It doesn't matter who's up here singing, who's up here playing, that we are comfortable engaging that place with God where no one else is in the room. It's just us and him. So we're going towards that. We're driving towards that. We're doing that on Friday nights. How many of y'all know? Friday night worship night. Friends online, it's not for you. Sorry. You guys, though. Um, and um, we, uh, we're really excited. There's been some awesome times to pass two Fridays this month that we've done it. We've just had an incredible time together. There's no preaching. I'm sorry for those of you that really enjoy having me preach. It's not Friday night, so, you know. But uh, for the rest of us, like, we, we've been able to engage that worship realm without distraction, without any other agenda, and it's been beautiful. And we are um, really looking forward to what happens the rest of this month and where God takes it. Because, you know, long-term strategy here at Bride Ministries, we want to have worship nights as part of the ongoing outreach that happens. Um, Eventually we may link arms with other churches in the region to enter in in that place of unity um, and uh, beyond. And so, but we have to, we have to carry a glory before we take it out. You know, uh, we, we have to kindle the fire here before we push it forward, you know, and, and, and um, that's the stage that we are at. Now, I have a few other announcements, so we're going to cruise through these because I know what you guys are here for. So, um, giving. I'm going to talk about giving for a minute. You know, in, in the book of Mark, chapter 12, Jesus is actually locating himself in an interesting place. He sits opposite the treasury. Why? 
because he's watching what people give. The Bible says, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now, here's what God wants from us. He wants all of us. Now, um, people uh, with a poverty mentality have a way of, of, of twisting this page and, and making it such that Jesus was absolutely dismissive of what the rich people gave. Well, that's not true. That was received. But the widow gave more because she gave everything. Now, here's the takeaway message. God watches how we give because that tells him something. That tells him where our heart is. You know, the Bible says where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. We call ourselves kingdom people. Well, where do we sow? Where do we vest ourselves? Are, are we vesting it in all kinds of selfish ambition, whatever we want, overcharging our credit cards and stuff to get stuff, you know, hopefully we're breaking that in the name of Jesus, but we are called to give. So we're going to go ahead and take the offering now. For those of you online, you know where the donate button is, and um, obviously we, at our donate button, have all kinds of ways. We also have Cash App now, by the way. For those of you that like that app, we have crypto, we uh, have Tithely and um, PayPal, and so there's no, no shortage of ways to give. And thank you for those of you that continue to support us. Now, I want to give you all another heads up. Now, there's a free platform called Manifest.Space. It's free. And it's um, kind of like an outreach of me and Christian. We made that available for bride tribers, for ongoing community and fellowship. And if you have not joined Manifest.Space, I want to encourage you to just go there, make a free profile. And one of the things that you will find there is uh, exclusive content. Like, we, we do training and stuff on Manifest.Space that isn't anywhere else. And so um, be sure to check that out because we do have some stuff coming up at the end of the month. And um, I want to make sure you guys are aware of that. There is really good news. How many of y'all enjoyed Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall? Okay, there may be a few of you. Guys, it's coming back. <laughs> Discovering Truth will be back in a couple months. We're, 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 we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to be getting some guests lined up. We're going to start recording, putting some things in the bucket. This is coming back. And so for those of you that have been through the desert, the long journey, like, wow, is this ever coming back? Man, it's coming. So look forward to that. Guess what else is back on the menu? Intensives. Now, some of you guys had signed up for these last year, and we canceled and refunded everybody all their money and said, we'll get back with you. What are intensives? They're three-day conferences in person where we are going to train you in one of four different modalities of ministry, advanced deliverance, inner healing, ministry to the human spirit, and ministry activation, which is how to administrate the unlocking of inheritance in Christ, such as the archi, the star, the mountain, the tree of righteousness, how to walk people through encounters on these levels, the living stones, so on and so forth. And so that uh, happens in four waves. The first wave is going to be in June, and that is going to be the weekend on uh, advanced deliverance. And so we have, I think, only 50 seats we're making available. Um, and so once those are gone, we'll just be... Uh, done unless we have so many people begging we may try to open a few more but right now it's 50 so once those are gone you know and and uh, they will be at a hotel here in Houston so we'll be three days you know and you'll be able to stay in the hotel come down we're going to have teaching training all day 
And I, 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 I know that some of you are like, wow, Daniel, you know, is this going to be any different than what's on your institute? Because you have a course called Advanced Deliverance on the Institute. Is it different? Completely. In fact, if you take the Advanced Deliverance course on the Institute, you will have a chance of feeling prepared for what's going to come at you in the intensive. All right? So... That's for those of you that want it, and um, it's also at intensive.bridemovement.com if you want to go straight to that page. Advance, I said this last week, we negotiated these rooms down to $150 a night from $270 a night. And then the ministry bought the rooms down so that we could make them available to you at a huge deficit to the ministry. Why? Because we want you there. So we took all of this abundance that we had from the offering in the last advance and poured it into you guys for this advance. We have 175 rooms. Those are way more than half gone. And I, you know, I, I want to keep reminding you guys until it's sold out, like they haven't been particularly accommodating this hotel. The Woodlands Resort in Houston was acquired by another hotel chain. Um, and They've uh, changed their attitude a little bit. They've been a bit difficult. And so there's no guarantee that we'll be able to get any more than 175 rooms, which means once those are gone, we'll make day passes available. And those of you that were, wait, Hope, do you have a, I have another announcement. It, this, is, this is handy, isn't it? Look at this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting... Announcements as we go. Look at this. What's going on? Okay. Announcement update. Um, okay. Many of you are trying to get a hold of Bride to ask a question. I know you want to talk to someone, but we don't have those types of resources. Please start with our website and support.bridemovement.com before you go to Facebook or try to email us. Friends, uh, we do get a lot of questions. And um, our administrative capacity is not large. In fact, uh, this entire ministry is run by basically me and uh, Christian part-time. And we have Kendra on staff, Hope on staff, and uh, uh, Zoe just started doing a little bit of contract work with us. But that's it. That's the whole, everything. Everything you see. And so we do not have the bandwidth to just do questions. Um, we do have coaches, but they don't just do questions. They will take sessions and answer all of your questions in session, coach.bridemovement.com. But we don't have anyone on staff to just say, hey, let me answer lots and lots of email questions. So that's an announcement. Now back to what I was saying, the advance. Once those 175 rooms are gone, guys, they, I don't know that there's anything we can do for you. So it'll be a day pass, and it may end up costing a whole lot more. So please keep that in mind. I don't want to have a whole bunch of people pounding down Hope's email like, please get me another room because Hope, Hope can only do what she can do. Praise God for Hope. So mm, you've been warned. We have added all of the coaches from the class of 2021 to coach.bridemovement.com, more resources than ever before. And for those of you that are on our waiting list, we're now moving through that waiting list twice as fast. Praise God. So if you've been waiting for a coach, it's coming. With that said, one last thing. How many of y'all were at 9 a.m. prayer today? Let me see your hands. Come on. Praise God. Let me tell you something. Jesus said, Daniel, I'm going to be at 9 a.m. prayer. And he was. <laughs> Wasn't the at 9 a.m. prayer? Come on. So I want to encourage you guys. Look, church, you, you could say the service starts at 10, but church starts at 9 a.m. Prayer. That's where it starts because that's where we are entering the atmosphere that we're going to engage the service from. So y'all decide whether or not you want to be hanging out with Jesus. <clears throat> Religious guilt 101. All right, <laughs> let's go. So, uh, the, you know, we, we've been in a series, guys, on God's shining ones. I'm going to say another word of prayer, and we're going to enter in where we left off. Father God, we just bless the sharing of the word today. We thank you that it goes forth unhindered and unchecked by any outside force. Furthermore, Lord God, we thank you that we have eyes to see, 
ears to hear, hearts to understand what your spirit is saying. We thank you that we are free of distractions, Lord God. And that uh, all ungodly and unauthorized astral traffic and trade is completely shut down, policed, and overruled by the power of the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that your kingdom comes and your will is done on earth in our lives as it is in heaven. And we thank you that we are being transformed also, that our spirits are up, attentive, engaged. And Lord God, we thank you for fruit that remains in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are opening up on God's shining ones with a passage of Scripture in Daniel 12, which says, at that time, verse 1, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine. Like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. We learned that we can't understand who we are until we understand who Jesus is. Come on. We learned um, about Jesus manifesting as fully God and fully man by doing a deep dive into Scripture. We built on that. And continue into a conversation on how uh, on the spirit and how our spirits were created in Christ long before we were conceived in the earth. We learned that we are the sons and daughters given by Yehovah for signs and wonders in the earth. And then looked at Elohim, right? Because we're building a foundation. We discussed Elohim, the triune God, and how man is patterned in the image of of God as a triune man. That went on and allowed us to discuss how we are created as sons of God. And as humans, we are separated from God through sin. And through faith in Christ Jesus, we are reconciled to God. And that restores our identity as sons of God, as humans. So, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And this is a heavenly office and identity that qualifies us to engage in operations on a cosmic level. We discuss pre-Adamic realities, we discussed the throne of David, the conquest agenda of heaven in Isaiah 60. One, so that I could take you to Isaiah 60. All of this is on YouTube. You can look at all of the past series. If you, this is your first time hanging out with us, I feel bad for you. There's a lot to catch up on. Now, in order to explore the commandment in Isaiah 60, which says, arise, shine, uh, we looked at the nature of the human spirit, and we spent last week talking about how um, the agenda for the spirit of man to come forward and be fully interactive with the agenda of heaven as we move into the end of the age is uh, heaven's agenda. Now, we left off on a subject of convergence. In other words, um, I was preparing to tell you the stages of manifestation of the spirit. And then we ran out of time. Can you imagine? You know what I told someone this morning? I said, I write my notes to make sure that I don't finish. I just write, and I'm like, well, I'll end somewhere in here. Probably at the most inconvenient spot. But you know what happens? Because some of you all watch series, you know, and, and, and you notice what they do now? They have, this, they, they have a plot. They never end the series at a reasonable spot because you got to come back next week. So they just stop. It's just like, what? The credits? So I took some notes. Now, here's the deal. The Bible describes various degrees of what it looks like for the Spirit to manifest to the surface 
of the physical body, or, you know, and I could expand that, just uh, the Bible describes various degrees of what it means for the spirit to manifest. Now, um, what I'm telling you, and what I was trying to explain last week, is that prior to this event called the resurrection of the dead, where the church is changed, you know, the, those who are alive and remain shall be changed, right? Um, prior to that, what I said is there, there, there is going to be those that are walking on the front lines with God that will experience increasing degrees of alignment within their human design, where not only is the spirit coming into its rightful posture as the driver of that human vessel, not the soul and not the flesh, right? The spirit gains the ascendancy to read the scroll and have the soul and the body get in line behind the heavenly scroll that we've been assigned from God. But there are degrees of, 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 of interaction that that spirit will grow into as it interacts with both sides of the veil, prior to a second coming context. And as we increase in this engagement through alignment, you will see more and more actual shining occur. Why? Because the spirit is light. The spirit is fire. Now, I shared this, and I'm going to say this again, Hebrews 6, 4, and 5. Before the second coming of Jesus Christ, we are going to have people that taste of the powers of the age to come. That means there is an age after Jesus returns. There are powers associated with that age, and there are people that will taste of those powers now. How do you know that, Dan Duvall? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So, how many of y'all know that David, as a king and a priest, tasted of the powers of the age to come? He did. He reached right across the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and experienced God in a way that was really opened up for us on this side of the cross. And he's an example. Because just like he reached across the age through who? Jesus. He actually reached through Jesus from the age he was in into the age that Jesus opened up. We are going to be able to reach through Jesus from the age that we are in into the age that he will open up. It's not that complicated and so it's staring there in the face now now we're talking about God's shining ones and the agenda of heaven to conquest to reorganize and restructure society it's not going to be business as usual the nations are going to well they're going to have to take sides and some are going to receive coaching from the luciferians and the sons of satan and some are going to receive coaching from the Jesus' people, and the sons of God. Isaiah 60 talks all about this and what happens to those nations that are getting on board. There's, there's so much more to the last days than we've given God credit for, and we're, we're, we're getting caught up in a number of conversations as we go in this direction. Now, now talking about manifesting the Spirit um, in different stages, you know, on one level... Those on the path to have their spirit manifesting um, will find that their spirit begins to do business independently of the body. Now, I'm going to unpack this and then I'm going to really unpack this. But let me explain something to you. Acts chapter 16 verse 9. Look at this. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, this is an interesting caption, right? It just kind of happens. And you just, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you. 
how many times I read right over this before I understood that the Spirit could actually make appearances. And you would call it a vision because you might encounter someone's Spirit coming to you in that place of prayer. You might be in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus and you meet someone there and you're like, oh, look, I'm meeting you. I don't even know who you are. And then one year later, you meet that person in the physical. Like there are meetings that get arranged in the Spirit that are the spirits of those whose humanity is being put in front of us in the natural. Now, this gets so confusing in the realm that we navigate because what's the difference between meeting someone's spirit in a vision and meeting someone's soul part in a vision? What's the difference between spirit travel and astral projection? We're going to have to talk about this because I'm not going to present you a one-sided picture and activate all the survivor parts to say, hey, we just got permission to go nuts. Well, look, we're going to break it down. But, but for the moment, you know, the Bible is very clear that the spirit can operate independent of the body. The man from Macedonia did not come to Paul. He did not journey a thousand miles. He just showed up in the spirit said, Please come and help us. Now, on another level, the spirit can overlap the physical body. The spirit can overlap the physical body. Now, let me tell you something. When Adam was in the garden, his spirit overlapped his physical body. If you met Adam, he would have looked like a son of God. Shiny, vibrant, clothed in light. Because his spirit would have been here, his body would have been behind that. Now, um, on a certain level, our spirits can do that also. Just because that's not been our experience doesn't mean it's not on the table. And for those that cooperate with the agenda of God to this end, to the end that they are really committed to, you know, getting their spirit strong and being fully fully committed to God's agenda for his bride in the last days, fully committed to, you know, um, their scroll. It's, it's like, it's, it's like a, a whole thing. It's going to open up. You're going to see this more and more. And, um, but you have, you have hints and windows of what it looks like when the Spirit does come to the surface. And let's look at a, 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 an example in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Now, in Acts chapter 7, you, you have a situation where Stephen is being stoned. He's being stoned. Why? For his faith in Jesus Christ. He's, he's being martyred. He's being martyred. And in Acts 7 verse 55, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And right before that, it says that his face shone like an angel. Now, what's happening there? Well, the truth is, Stephen's spirit came to the surface, and for that reason, the reason of the light and fire that was his spirit man, his face shone like an angel. That's what I'm talking about. When the Spirit comes and overlays on the body, it can cause shining. So you see Stephen shining. His face shines like an angel. And what happens next is the veil between dimensions collapses to his experience. So he gazes into heaven and sees the glory of God. It's almost like there is no veil at all. Now, the way the Lord explained it to me in 2016, he said, you know, basically that there's going to be increasing degrees to which the Spirit is going to interact on both sides of the veil. First, beginning on the Spirit side of the veil, the interaction, the engagement, the activity is going to skyrocket. As that goes up over time, 
you're going to see more and more of an increase on engagement in this side of the veil by the Spirit. And uh, so, 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 so here's a, here's a little um, I guess excerpt from my notes. I mean, we'll talk about it. Um, God said, now today I'm going to give you some insight into what it means for your spirit man to manifest. It actually means different things at different times. In one sense, it is the out-of-body work that occurs according to your trans-dimensional nature. As people encounter the spirit in the spirit realm, this is a preliminary form of manifestation. The spirit can show up in dreams, spiritual landscapes, and when people's eyes are open to the spirit realm. They can see the actions performed by a human spirit. This is all under the umbrella of what is known as the preliminary phase of manifestation. It is the execution of heavenly assignments in conjunction with the appointment of my Holy Spirit. It does not stem from a conscious decision of the soul to do certain things, but from an assignment and partnership that exists between me and your spirit, essentially keeping the soul out of the loop. Now, this was my journal entry, right? So I'm journaling God, and I'm saying, okay, well, let's, let's test this out. How can this kind of a statement ground out? And, you know, immediately I went right back to Acts chapter 16 and verse 9. The man from Macedonia. He came, he showed up, he gave Paul a message. And then what happened was we began to have a lot of experiential realm encounters. So from 2016 onward, I, I can no longer keep track of how many people have come to me, often privately because, you know, they are confused. And they said, Daniel, I was in a deliverance session and your spirit showed up. Daniel, I was in a prayer uh, intercession meeting and your spirit showed up. Daniel, I was in a dream, and your spirit showed up and gave me a prophetic message. Like, you know, I, and, and it's gone the other way, too. I've been in prayer, and I've had people that I know show up. And I'm like, hey, you're sp- what are you doing here? What's up? And, and they'll often have some kind of business, and I'll become aware of that as I'm in my prayer closet. And it's like, wow, this is happening. This is a real thing. Um... And so, so this is like, wow, but, but, but what's, the, what, what's happening? Well, we are in a preliminary phase of, of a takeover agenda. And so God is activating human spirits all over the world. And people are being activated. They don't even know that this is what's happening to them. But it is happening. And what's happening is there's a lot of covert operations that these human spirits are being recruited into, assigned to, and it is the dismantling of the new world order and the deep state agendas from the spirit side of the veil. They're being sabotaged by God's shining ones. They don't even know it's happening, and on some levels they do. But a lot of it is covert, and it's, it's preliminary because there's a lot of things that have been set up. So, and there's been different phases because there was a setting up of the dominoes phase and then the dominoes started to be knocked down. We're in a stage of this preliminary phase, I'm just speaking prophetically now, where the dominoes are falling. Now, to those that are really connected to the spirit, what I just said is making a whole lot of sense. Some of us are just like, what? So, that's okay, that's okay. So we're going to walk through this, though. Now, I told you <laughs> when I started this series, I said, I can't really get to the meat because if we don't lay the foundation first, like all you can do is choke. Because this, this, is, this, this, is, this gets really cool as we go down the line. Because we're actually looking at the unfolding of a plan that really has not been fully articulated to my knowledge. And, um, you know, before going further and walking down the line of like the spirit manifesting on the physical body, I am going to address the difference between astral projection and spirit travel. Because there's a huge difference. First of all, Daniel, how do they feel different? Answer, astral projection is the projection of the soul or a soul part out of the body. Spirit travel is when the human spirit 
moves about the spirit world in accordance with its transdimensional nature. Because the soul is our presenting consciousness, it, it, this, that's the thing. The soul is the presenting consciousness. When we astral project, and by we I mean you because I don't know how to do it, um, when astral projection happens, it is extremely vivid. It actually feels like your experience out of your body because it is. The presenting consciousness has a vivid interaction with the spirit world without the confinement of the physical body. So it can fly around. It can uh, feel weightlessness, the, 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 the injuries or sickness and disease states of the body have much less influence on what that soul feels when it's out of body. You know, a lot of survivors have soul parts that don't even want to be in the body because the body's so broken, they hate being inside of it. So astral projection for the soul is extremely vivid. But spirit travel feels more like a dream or a vision. Because, as we already laid the groundwork for, the body, soul, and spirit all have their own minds, emotions, intellects. And so if I want to plug into my spirit and his travel, I have to ask my spirit a question. Where are you going? And what have you been working on? And my spirit will actually be able to tell my soul the answer to that question. As I open up that communication, I can begin to plug into that knowledge, and it feels like a dream or a vision. It's very hazy. It's gentle. It's gentle. It's not nearly as vivid or as dynamic. Now, people that have been exposed to lots of occult activity... That's not as exciting. I'd rather just fly around in the spirit world. So sometimes it's a big sacrifice for people that have been exposed to the occult to lay down their astral projection abilities because it's more fun. Leaning into spirit travel is submission. It means that I'm submitting to the knowledge and the execution of assignments that are not under my soul's control. Because it's being inspired and led by the Spirit of God when it's working right. Okay, next point. What are some of the differences between astral projection and spirit travel? Answer. The soul has a silver cord. But the spirit does not. The spirit does not have a silver cord. It doesn't matter how far the spirit goes from the physical body... There is no limit to ability to travel. Now, for people that are trying to get initiated with transcendental meditations so that they can astral project, maybe they don't have a trauma background on the level of some of our Illuminati survivors and bloodliners. What they find quickly is that they can astral project a distance out of the body. But once they get to the end of the block, once they get a few houses down the street, they can't go further because there's this silver cord It's tying them to the body. Now, the more iniquity is present, the more trauma is present, uh, the easier it gets to go very far. So I have survivors that can actually project to the moon with no problem. Totally different levels of exposure. Now, the soul has a silver cord, but the spirit does not. So the capacity for the spirit to execute function in the spirit world is much greater. In fact, one of the reasons why it is not a good idea for people to astral project is because of the level of vulnerability those soul parts have in the spirit world. Now you could astral project and get stuck in a grid. You could get captured by a warlock. You could get bound by a team of demons for trespassing. And now you're locked up and in a very bad situation. This happens to soul parts that astral project all willy-nilly all the time, which is one of the reasons why when people sit down in front of me finally after a lifetime of trauma and occult exposure, we're having to go from region of captivity to region of captivity, just collecting all the soul parts that are in bondage. 
It's just one of the reasons. There are others. Now, um, another difference. I do not need near-death experiences to prepare my spirit for spirit travel. As I get strong in Christ and I get strong in my spirit, my spirit will begin to take assignments from God all by itself. And it will be powerful and it will be effective in that. But astral projection, well, people are prepared for those abilities through near-death experiences. These near-death experiences are built into what you're going to go through if you've been subjected to satanic ritual abuse or government-sponsored mind control agendas. So you are going to be a child getting drowned in a bathtub. You are going to be going through different kinds of traumas of this nature, and I'm not going to go through that because there are children here. But, um, you know, oftentimes when you have people that can't remember their childhoods and they are prone to extremely robust encounters in the spirit world, that is because they were prepared for astral projection through the trauma and near-death experiences they dissociated. Now, one of the things, it was my criticism of uh, Christian mysticism as it's been, you know, developing more recently. That not only do they lean into Kabbalah for some of the teachings that happen in that realm, but from what I have witnessed, there is no distinction between spirit travel and astral projection. Because in Kabbalah, which is the foundation for some of Christian mysticism that's happening more recently, you use Merkabah mysticism. What does that mean? That means, for lack of better terms, astral projection. You're using a spiritual vehicle to pull your soul out of your body and ascend the Kabbalah tree, which will open up realms of encounter, but they're not realms of God's kingdom. Though you may find beings and angels and other stuff that, you know, has different ideas for you. During these experiences. So, with that said, I'm clearly delineating the line. Why? Because we're growing into maturity. I don't want you guys to be confused. And a lot of folks that I talk to have been, you know, compromised on this level because of occult exposure. Now, um... For most survivors... Astral projection is something that their parts do with or without the consent of their presenter. Let me explain. So one of the things that the Bible says is, uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. Well, why does he have to restore your soul? Because it's broken. What happens when the soul breaks? Well, let's reframe that. You have parts that split off of the core soul through dissociation because of trauma. Now God has to heal our brokenness. And the thing is, um, when people have a lot of trauma and parts have broken off, what happens is that these parts, especially if they are alternate personalities um, that have received some training, in the spirit world or otherwise, they will leave the body independent of the presenting soul's understanding. Now, there's a term that's been floated. It's called the clueless Christian presenter. I meet these people all the time. God bless you. <laughs> so what is a clueless Christian presenter? Let me explain. It is when you have a situation that a person believes themselves to be holier than thou. And, yeah, maybe they can't remember anything about their childhood. And maybe they, you know, don't um, always have the best experiences in certain things. Or maybe they just think they're a targeted individual for reasons unexplored or unknown. But they are definitely having all of their stuff together. And you can't tell them otherwise. They know. And so the clueless Christian presenter happens when a person is programmed to have a part of their soul that holds the surface, that is Christianized, 
while ensuring that no one discovers, especially that presenter, all of the cult loyal parts of the soul that sit behind the amnesia wall in their system. By system, I mean heart or subconscious. So when you run into a clueless Christian presenter, they will never sign up for healing or deliverance. They probably will be offended regularly when anyone suggests you don't have it all together. And they will squat in a church and hold space while the cult loyal soul parts astral project from behind the amnesia wall, hold hands with demons, project demonic frequencies, create distraction, target babies to make them cry, target the preacher, try to shut down the worship over the house, do all kinds of things. And especially when churches don't understand this, they don't even know how to pray to shut it down. Praise God that we know how to pray to shut it down. You come into this environment, martial law for you. In the name of Jesus. But this happens all the time. So, so these covens and these uh, groups, they groom certain of their people to have strong Christian presenters so that they can plant them in the churches and squash the move of the Spirit of God. All of this happens through the gate of astral projection because it's the soul parts leaving the body that are working to ruin things. Um, now, uh, with that said, spirit travel happens when the human spirit travels. Now, let's have a balanced conversation about this. Just because the spirit is traveling does not mean it's traveling due to an assignment from God. Now, we're going to make another distinction. It can happen for holy reasons, and it can happen for other reasons. So one of the passages that helps us to understand a little bit more about spirit travel comes from the book of Judges, chapter 15. Beginning in verse 17, it says, And so it was, when he had finished speaking, that he threw the jawbone from his hand. Who is this? This is Samson. He killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. You know what happens when you... Fight a battle that is that long and arduous? You're tired and thirsty. So, he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi, and he became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank. And his spirit returned. Someone say, his spirit returned. Now, I will have you know that in order to return, one must first leave. In order for the spirit to return, one must first leave. What is shocking to many people is that, yeah, okay, you're created a spirit, soul, and body, but if you go through something that's traumatic enough for the physical body or the soul, sometimes the spirit will travel. And I have met so many people whose spirits have exited stage left during childhood abuse, rituals, and trauma. I'm out of here. I'm not sticking around. This is too hard. I didn't think it was going to be this tough when I took this assignment from heaven. This is one of the big betrayals that happens for people that are survivors. It's the betrayal of the spirit to the soul. Where the spirit is the one that signs up for the assignment. But the soul is the one that gets stuck doing the assignment. It's kind of like the bozo that gets the woman pregnant promising her the moon. And then leaves the country never to be found again. And now she's responsible to raise the kids. But he signed up. Where's the man? So the spirit just gone with the wind. Now, 
In Samson's case, his body went into a state of trauma because of all of the war that he was going in. What did his spirit do? It left. It actually left. He thought he was going to die. And when he drank the water, his spirit returned. So sometimes the spirit will show up once things get a little better. Sitting in a session with Dan Duvall. I've been a survivor for 35 years. Started to get back some memories. We do some ministry work, suddenly the Spirit's back. Hello. And, you know, sometimes the soul is a little upset. Where have you been all these years? There's so many people in the church are like, yeah, my spirit isn't around. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, Dan. Every time you talk about the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, I never feel the Spirit. Yeah, there's a reason why. This is one of them. Sometimes we have been separated from our spirit through trauma that spirit is gone. It's fled the coop. And sometimes, and this is really interesting, when you try to bring the spirit back and there's a lot of offense in a piece of the soul that's sitting in the subconscious, not even at the surface, it's like that piece of the soul will stand at the gate and not let the spirit back in. So it's like, all right, you know, realm buster prayer, whatever, bring the spirit back. Tell me if your spirit is present. I don't feel anything. And I'm looking at him in the spirit, and I see, you know, Queen B, we'll just leave it at that, standing at the gate like this. And I'm like, there's a massive soul part standing there blocking your spirit. So you say you can't feel your spirit, you can't see your spirit, nothing. But there's someone on the inside of you that does not want the spirit back. Let's talk to Queen B. What's going on with you? I'm not letting this good-for-nothing dope back in here. We can do it ourselves. This is real-world stuff. So on the journey to God's shining ones and getting people activated fully on the level that, you know, their spirit is strong, taking the headship of the lives, reading the scroll, taking the assignments. Sometimes we have to go way back. And deal with the brokenness of the soul that's shutting the spirit down and that's counterfeiting spiritual encounters because astral projection is at play and not spirit travel that is legitimate. How many of y'all follow that conversation? Look, so, so, so we have to have some proficiency across the board if we're ever going to come to the level of maturity that God has envisioned for his bride. I had to be able to create tools for survivors if I could ever be trusted to help steward uh, journeys into the greater glory. Because I happen to serve a God who leaves the 99 to find the one just so happens. That's the one who hired me. Now, we talk about the preliminary phase where it's like, okay, so the spirit begins to be strong, to take assignments in the spirit world, to do things. We're at this stage in history where a whole bunch of dominoes to collapse evil agendas in the world have not only been set up, but they are now being toppled. This is what I wrote in my journal. So I wrote, uh, moving on from the preliminary form of manifestation of which you've already achieved, right? Because God was talking to me, and I had already begun to, you know, understand some of this stuff. I, I realized, you know, and in my experience, the way it happened was um, I began to know that my spirit was doing assignments for God while I slept. It was, it, and, and I would wake up in the morning tired. And when I started inquiring about, like, why am I so tired? Tired. Like, now I know why I'm tired, because my baby wants my attention at 1 a.m., 3 a.m., and sometimes 4.30 a.m. You know, there's nothing worse than when your baby wants your attention 30 minutes before your alarm goes off. Oh. <laughs> but you're so cute. So, um, but I was tired then, and I was like, why am I so tired? God was like, well, your spirit's taking assignments. And I, I, I had to come to a place of understanding of that. But then there was a graduation point where the soul got stronger, the spirit got stronger in Christ. And then I transitioned and my spirit started to take assignments all the time. 
day or night. It didn't matter. And, and my ministry transitioned because there was a point where I would lean heavily into my human spirit to do my work with SRAs and, and, and mind control stuff long before I had all the tools. Like, I didn't have prayers at the beginning. I, those got written over time. Like, I didn't have all the techniques worked out. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. And I leaned heavily into my spirit and pulled so much from my spirit that became the techniques that I eventually articulated and was able to train other people with, plus study and other things. But, but over time, my soul got more and more entrusted with the stewardship of the ministry because my spirit is way ahead of me handling other business. So, you know, as, as a person comes into more and more maturity, the, the spirit and the soul, it, it's a dance, an interaction. Um, and, and so anyway, okay. Journaling, right? Um, you've already achieved phase one. In phase one, uh, the spirit will begin to stand visible from the spirit realm as a type of apparition. In other words... When this is happening, as people look at you, they'll actually see him. Uh, this will be true of some, but not all people. Uh, some will see the form of the Spirit. Others will see light or various colors. Projections will come off the physical body and be perceived as distortions of reality. And it'll be strange to behold. And um, so phase one is not necessarily this full overlap like we looked at with Philip. Not Philip, um, Stephen. Uh, but there's like the spirit is there. And so reality is a little weird when it's that close, that heavy. So he, he, he said... Later, in phase two, um, it will be fulfilled that operation in the powers of the age to come will begin in plain sight and business as usual. Geographies will align with my shining ones and they will be seen in open society for what they are. As to the appearance of my shining ones, there will be a flickering. At times, their form in the spirit will face to the front and the natural so as to overtake the physical form, but it will not hold. In and out will they be as the veil is maintained by unbelief and insecurity. He actually used those two terms, unbelief and insecurity. Um, and then he said, it'll be relatively short-lived considering all things. I don't, anything about time and God, I just, I don't know. But then he said, what shall be, what will be shall be seen, but full eclipse will not be yet. For that will remain for an appointed time. In this phase, the physical qualities of the body will be affected as the form of my shining ones flickers in and out. Cells will reorganize and realign and then go back to settle in their abiding state according to the natural. And this is really what you see Stephen stepping into in Acts chapter 7. Everyone looked and saw the cells realign and reorganize. They looked at what appeared to them to be the face of an angel. They saw the face of his spirit sitting on top of his face. Whoa. And it was a moment. It was just a flicker. It was just a flicker. So what I'm saying is, the way the Lord is explaining it to me, it's like there are stages in a progression Towards an ultimate end. Now, then he talked about phase three. He said phase three is the takeover. This, you know, this is what he told me. He said, uh, this is when the form and abiding state of your spirit fully manifests into the natural for who he or she is. The manifestation of the spirit body you abide in onto the earth plane is the final phase. So, when this happens, it's like the abilities go off the charts. So um, then he said, you know, my shining ones deliver the kingdoms of this world to Jesus Christ in the flesh as he marries heaven back to earth. In other words, the shining ones are the transition generation. So again, um, 
what God was helping me to understand is there's a progression that is before us. Now, traditional dispensational premillennialism looks at the second coming of Christ as an evacuation followed by torment for the people that try to come to Jesus, followed by Jesus handling everything because he's God all by himself and we're no good, low down, worthless sinners saved by grace who really are nothing more than a parenthesis in God's plan for the genetic Israelites that he's still really after. You see, so to go from that mindset and teaching to what I'm explaining is quite a big leap. It's, it's, it's hard. And I'm not trying to take that away from anybody because some of you guys are going to hear this. Not today, those of you online. Some of you will find these a year or two from now and be freaking out. Like, whoa, this is so different. You mean that God intends to raise up a company of people that come to the unity of the faith, unto a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That Actually, yes. That's, that's uh, and, you know, we, what do we call it? We call it bride ministries. Why? Because God is preparing his bride for his arrival. It's a big part. We're, 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 we're going to be of marriage age. One of the things God pointed out to me, he said, and this is a shocker, he said, Dan, I'm not a pedophile. I'm not interested in marrying babies or young children. I'm a real man. I want a full-grown woman. And this is why the Freemasons are the one preaching dispensational premillennialism. I really believe this. I believe that every Freemason should either renounce their Freemasonry or be kicked out of the ministry. Without exception. I really believe this because I just happen to know a little too much. Now, this is what God continued to say, and I, I'm going to be honest. I, I, I cut out a lot of what I'm sharing with you guys because some of it is just too much for now. But the, he, he continued, and this is what, what he said. He said, as the manifestation moves into its various phases, the knowledge and perception of the Spirit will be brought into the natural by the Spirit. So you will engage the Spirit and the natural as one, so will others, by degrees. There will be a degree of this in the preliminary stage as you are experiencing even now. Moving into phase one is your spirit manifests like an apparition while you're physically present or ministering. Or even not necessarily ministering at times. Sometimes it could just be there when you're just sitting around. Your capacity to engage the natural and the spirit as one will grow, become off the charts. It will be expanding from there during phase two when the spiritual ceases to be perceived as a separate reality from the natural. So the perception will bring to the forefront of what you call conscious mind the mysteries of the spirit and they will be seen and engaged by those manifested just as the physical is seen and engaged by those manifested. In other words, that I have all of these resources in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the point at which every time someone needs a new liver, it's just like, there it is, fwap. Oh, you need new lungs. There they are. Flop. Oh, you need crazy provision. $500,000. There it is. Flop. It's real like this world is real. We're in a full engagement of both realms as a matter of life, as a matter of fact. It's casual, normal, everyday living. And I've been saying this for years. Real kingdom living is living life on both sides of the veil simultaneously. Anyway, so, but he said it's going to get a whole lot easier, right? Because how many of y'all know, we've all been there. I say, ah, 
All right, let's pray for a new liver. Yeah, I mean, I went through this. I was like sitting there in the hospital. I'm like, I got all this revelation. My appendix is bad. I'm like, God, give me a new appendix. Oh, you know, I mean, it's like, all right, this, this hasn't fully processed through yet. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not Superman up here like, all right, I'm so much more spiritual than y'all. I mean, I, I had my appendix removed with surgery. <laughs> I get it. Like, there are things I'm believing God for still. I'm believing God. I'm on this journey with you. I'm just telling you about it. I'm like, let's, let's take the journey together. You know, let's take the journey together. One of the things I learned in Bible school, if you pray for someone and they don't get healed, pray for someone else. Just keep trying. Keep going for it. <laughs> Don't let facts dictate your faith. All right. So, um, so as it, it moves on, he said, uh, this perception will bring to the forefront of what you call conscious mind, the mysteries of the spirit. He said, the enemy will be brutally afflicted by my people. That's what he said to me. And it will take everything they can muster to hold their ground. For their armies will be impaled by the glory I reveal to my people. What do we read about in Isaiah 61? The Lord has glorified his house. Wow. 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 The earth and the bride are to be delivered to my son. My shining ones will do it. So we talk about a transition generation. We talk about a transition generation. You know, and, and it's clear in Scripture. It's clear in Scripture. This couldn't be more clear. Jesus is so committed to the resurrection of the dead, he said, I am the resurrection. Now, to my knowledge, I have never fully transfigured. But stage three of this manifestation, right? I call it stage two, where you um, see something of, of the likeness of Stephan in his martyrdom. But stage three really looks like the transfiguration of Jesus. Let me explain. Matthew chapter 17, verses one through five. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them what happened his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light hmm and behold Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him then Peter answered and said to Jesus Lord is it good for us to be here if you wish let us Make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Because Jesus came and touched them. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. What's happening there? Jesus has his God spirit overlaying his physical body, and he is fully transfigured. Is there any separation between dimensions where he's standing? No. In fact, it's so extreme he pulls the disciples right out of the earth dimension. They're talking with Moses and Elijah, who are not there physically. The cloud overshadows Jesus. They're having a conversation with the Father. Not really a conversation. It's kind of like a one-way statement. But it's communication. They're in the dimensions of God's glory as Jesus is transfigured. Now, can you imagine? The Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, what Jesus demonstrates in transfiguration becomes a permanent state as we are changed at his coming. But there are degrees of manifestation leading up to that as we execute 
final agendas going into the last days. And I don't know what all the timelines are, so don't ask. Daniel, will this happen next year? I don't know. That's not my job. I'm just a messenger. I'm just a messenger. Transition generation. Now, I've used this term many times, but I'm going to break some time, take some time to break down what it means. Uh, but, you know, to, to say it plainly, there is a generation that never dies. There is a generation that never dies. So, to put a, light, a nice little bow on the concept, you know, the third phase of God's shining ones, that transfiguration state where that is happening really happens in conjunction with the transition into the generation that sees the resurrection of the dead and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Like, we're moving right into that realm of conversation. So this is the generation that finishes the final works that introduce the world to Jesus Christ at his coming. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We will not all die. We will not all die. The generation that steps into full expression of their mandate to the world and the plans of Jesus Christ will not die because Jesus returns. And we are permanently changed. So, leading up to that, we are stepping into ever-increasing dimensions of the unveiling of God's glory in and through us. It's not zero to a hundred. It's a progression of maturation and unlocking. And there are certain things that in order for God to bring it into the earth, they have to be unlocked in the heavens. And there's a process right now that we're in. There are a lot of things being unlocked, put in place, and prepared so that some of the things that I'm talking about will come about in the eventual process of time. Now, here's another passage. The powers of the age to come have been made available to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We talked about that. However, there's going to be a generation that arises to fully embrace them. You know what it says in Revelation chapter 6, chapter 19 in verse 6. Look at this. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself. Made herself. Ready. Let me tell you something about when I got married. I did not do my wife's makeup. And I did not fix her hair. Why not? Because the pattern is for the wife to make herself ready. And to her, it was granted. Notice that it says, it doesn't say, and the wife found a way to get rescued. Doesn't say that. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Let me tell you something. There is a righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that is an identity. But how many of you know that there are unrighteous acts that we can do from a righteous identity in Christ that carry consequences. Just because you're the righteousness of God in Christ does not mean that if you steal from a bank, you will not go to jail. 
So you can do unrighteous things from a place of righteousness established in Christ Jesus. One of the biggest things to help people reorganize in their minds is that their actions are not their identity. We separate actions from identity because that's how we're delivered. The devil wants you to think your actions are your identity. So you do something, and it's not such a great work product. Well, you know, this isn't going to work out. I guess I'm just not good enough. No, you are good enough. But your work product stunk. So we can get some more training. This is the kind of stuff that happens to people all the time. They get stuck in accepting failure and lack as identity. When really, it's not. But it's the same thing with righteousness. We have righteousness in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. It's who you are. But you can do unrighteous things. But the wife has garments that are established because of righteous acts. Meaning, she's doing something awesome. Do something awesome. What does that look like? What we're talking about. Finishing the final works. Coaching the nations. Arising. Shining. Then he said to me, verse 9, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. The transition generation is composed of those that cooperate with God. Heaven must receive Jesus until the restoration of all things. The Bible says in Acts 3, 19 and 21, I'm tying together all, and I, you know, repeating some of these verses over and over again because we're making a picture. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by his holy prophets since the world began. What does that word restoration mean? It means the return to the way things were before the fall and the reinstatement of true theocracy. I told you that last week. Now, that word is apocatastasis. Now, this is the thing. Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 11 says, Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The seventh trumpet is the time of full transition of the world into the second coming of Jesus Christ and the glorification of the church in permanence. During this event, it is written, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. This verb tense, have become, indicates an action that began at an indeterminable point in the past and has continued to completion in the present. Have become. The transition generation is involved in reforming kingdoms of the earth and the nations in the face of an imposing new world order. Wow. This takes us into the seventh trumpet, which inadvertently takes us into the bride, the wedding processional, the virgins. All of these wonderful, extraordinary concepts we'll have to explore next week. Because I'm going to tell you all something. My wife said, Dan Duvall, you long-winded preacher, you've been trampling on the people's time. time for the people's time. We're going to answer your questions and we are going to engage with a mellow track under my voice so it sounds real cool. The only thing I forgot was shades. Friends, 
um, we're here for you. And so I am opening up my email and I am going to get to the people's time. With Kendra's help, we're gonna make it happen. So, <laughs> y'all you like that? You like this addition? Uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how the people online feel about it. Uh, we'll get there. All right. What do we have from the people? And by the way, if uh, you want to get some questions in, friends, and I don't get to all of these, you can send those over as well, and I will do my best. Denzel, our friend, said, What's the difference between principalities and dominions? Goodness. Well, uh, here's the deal. Principalities are ruling spirits over territories or regions. So in the kingdom of darkness, it's like any other government. They have regional rulers, rulers that rule over larger territories. You'll have principality type spirits that sit over communities, cities. You know, they're governing authorities. Um, oftentimes they may have some kind of council associated with their operations. They typically answer to higher ranking things. Principalities are, as I've understood more and more about how the spirit world works, not a classification of spirit. In other words, you meet principalities that are both high-ranking demons and principalities that are fallen angels. It's not either or. There are principalities that can be either or. It's, it's interesting. Now, dominions, well... In my experience, um, I've, I've met some dominions in, in the course of my work, and they like, they're like frequencies almost. It's, it's very interesting. They'll have like a, like a color associated with them. They're like an algorithm or an equation. And they um, have an influence on the way the creation is structured. It's, it's, it's very interesting. They're like cosmic, celestial, expansive things. And they have a presenting consciousness. So that's how I've engaged dominions. And, you know, my, it was interesting because when my spirit first started to go out and take assignments, um, when God explained it to me, one of the things that he told me was, the dominions have been calling on you. That is my spirit. And it started because we, you know, in the course of my work with someone, we had actually met a dominion that it was uniquely interfaced with their system as a government-sponsored mind control project survivor. And um, they were using this person because their unique connection to the dominion allowed them to use that dominion for its equations and its nature to do time travel. And so as we were doing work to redeem certain things, it actually was shutting down some time travel operations. It was healing some of the holes that they had opened up in the, you know, this fabric, particular fabric of the creation that was this dominion. And um, we had several conversations about what was happening in the process. So this was my experience, you know, take it or leave it. Um, but we worked with one. There are a whole number of them, and they seem to kind of coincide, like just like you have different frequencies associated with green and blue and purple and orange, like there are different dominions that are different frequencies, algorithms connected on that level. So that, that's my understanding of it from experience. And, um, hmm, you know, hope that helps. Next question comes from our friend Jean. And she said, can one person operate in all gifts of the fivefold ministry or just one or two? I love this question because so many people have been put in bondage to this idea that God gives, because, because it says in, in the book of 1 Corinthians, to one he gives the spirit of, uh, or, or, or the gift of the um, word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge to another, gifts of healings to another, working of miracles. Um, and so it in, in certain religious ways of reading this passage, it seems like God only gives one gift to each person. And so that's how God makes us special. He gives us one gift that's ours, you know, and it's going to distinguish us from someone else. Now, one of the things that, that is hilarious to me 
is watching uh, certain denominations that do not actually practice the gifts teach about the gifts. Like, I love it. Like, you know, your church believes that uh, God stopped giving the church gifts in, in the book of Acts. Like the first church, that's when it all dried up. No one speaks in tongues, but you're going to teach 1 Corinthians chapter 12? And so they come to all kinds of ridiculous conclusions. But when you begin to walk out with God in the process of actually executing the gifts, what you learn is all gifts are given by the self-same Spirit, that is Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit is the source of power for the gifts. And really, if you map it right, what you understand is the Holy Spirit will actually come upon the soul and manifest those gifts largely through the soul. And when the Spirit gets involved, everything goes to another level. It's wild. So you have a whole lot of people in the body of Christ that can move in the gifts of the Spirit. Healings, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. And when you try to engage their spirit, it's nowhere to be found. I've had so many people come with me questions on this level like, Daniel, how can I pray in tongues for all these years and my spirit isn't here? Doesn't that mean my spirit is praying? Well, your spirit can be praying when you're praying in tongues, but the gift to pray in tongues is the Holy Spirit sitting on your soul. So you have that gift whether your spirit is present or not. Um, furthermore, the gifts are because it's the same Holy Spirit that's giving them all. There's no limit to what Holy Spirit can do in an individual. If you keep your hand up, eventually you're going to be the recipient of multiple distributions. So you may start with the gift of tongues, but, you know, keep your hand up. I want to interpret. I want to interpret. It might not come one month, two months, three months in, but it will come. It will come. And that's what happened with me. Like, I, I couldn't interpret tongues for a while, but I kept my hand up. I said, I just want to be able to do it. And eventually, <laughs> there came a point where I found, oh, I can interpret my tongues. And not only can I interpret, like, I can interpret them back to myself in order to unlock the word of the Lord. So I began doing this practice where I was just praying in tongues, interpret it back to myself, and unpack revelations of the kingdom of God. It was crazy. I recommend that exercise. Um, you know, gifts of healings. Like, you want to receive that gift from Holy Spirit, keep praying for people and pressing into it. Like, I want to pray for person after person after person, Holy Spirit, until you begin demonstrating this gift through my life. I am not going to stop. I'm committed to this. And you will find that over time, not only will your faith grow, but that gift will actually come on you and people will start getting healed more and more often and with more and more power. It's, it's, it's really cool. So don't I want to encourage everybody here. Don't limit Holy Spirit. Like, we're moving towards maturity, right? And um, with that said, yeah, all of the gifts, I believe, are on the table. Now, the next question, and, and, and I will say this uh, uh, other point. You know, there are different sets of, of gifts as you study out the Scripture. You have 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gifts, which are gifts of the Spirit. Um, you also have redemptive gifts of Romans chapter 12. And then you have ascension gifts of Ephesians chapter 4. Those are different categories and serve different functions. The redemptive gifts are not gifts of the Spirit in the same way. So just putting that out there. Linda, our friend Linda asks, When God increases your metron, does the level of warfare increase or the kind of warfare or both? Both. So what does Metron mean? Paul said, I will not boast beyond measure. In, in this particular quote of Paul in one of his epistles, what he's saying is, I will not boast beyond my Metron measure. What is his measure? It's a sphere of authority that he was allocated under the jurisdiction of God and his kingdom. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and those who dwell therein. How many of you all know that because you got saved, the whole earth comes under your jurisdiction? Of course not. No, there is such a thing as trespassing, even when you are a son or daughter of God operating in Christ Jesus. So we receive what's called a metron, which is a sphere of authority. It's kind of like the same situation where you had emperors and then you had governors or regional kings, like in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. 
So you had an emperor that was a supreme commander over the whole realm, and then you had all of these kings that sat over different regions. That's how it is in God's kingdom. We have a region that we govern, and over time, that can expand. First, it starts with self. Can you govern yourself? <laughs> Easier said than done. Let's expand that. Can you govern your house? Can you govern your family? Can you govern your business? Can you govern your ministry? Can you govern your uh, community? Right? And as that influence realm expands, so does the authority. And so, <laughs> you know, anyone that's expanding, God's, God's going to back if they're doing it right, but the devil will oppose. God will back you, but the devil will oppose. Let me tell you something. I know from experience. And so, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely both. Can we pray? Can we pray? You know, Father God, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for your truth the power of your word. And Lord God, that you are igniting a new revelation on the inside of us that is taking us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Father God, I issue deliverance from unbelief, religion, and lack of faith in the name of Jesus. Lord God, allow us to internalize that you have an extraordinary destiny for your people that is going to reframe the earth. Father God, I speak downloads into human spirits that are taking us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And Father God, we choose to release in your peace and joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, friends online, we'll see you all next week.